Uh, good, good morning, morning, everybody. We are Morgan Trust 411. I'm Audrey Boyce. Now my co-host Kevin Casey, and we are here with Dave Stevens, my favorite, because he's the unbiased mortgage filter. Unbiased, no filter is probably a better way to put it, right, Dave? You got it. Uh huh. I love it. I love it. Okay, so let's start off with a few announcements. First one is there is a camp event, which I think is with. CMA also on March 9th in Newport Beach. Newport Beach is a lovely spot in case you haven't been there. And they are going to do a little cocktail party or cocktail something from 5 to 6.30. I would highly recommend attending if you are in the vicinity. And then, very importantly, attend NAM Ledge Legislative Conference, April 14th through the 18th. It's in Washington, D.C. This is where you meet the people who could regulate or legislate you out of business right? In or out of business. So it's important that we are aware of what's going on out there more than ever before. Well, probably always, but from our perspective, more than ever before, because, you know, we're here now. So make sure that you're paying attention to this stuff and join your associations and support their efforts, because it, it, there's, a, there's a lot happening. <sighs> Dave. And your word means something. It, it is does. really impressive. When I first went there, I was really blown away that what I told the, my representative actually changed the rules. And it was like, oh, wow, they listen and, and it works. So yes, know, Ke Kevin shows up and single-handedly changes mortgage policy across the U.S. Good for you. you I know, got lucky. What can I say? You know, there's an organization right now who's taking credit right now for single-handedly taking out the, you know, taking off 30 basis points of the FHA MIP. They're like, well, thank gosh that we've got our pack. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, Organizations, there are organizations who have been working on this stuff for literally years. And so it's when we all come together and work together that that kind of change happens. And that's why isolating yourself in a certain segment is not great. So come together as a whole for the industry and work for the betterment of all of our borrowers, because that's really what it should be about in the end. Although sometimes it doesn't feel like that's <clears throat> how it is. So Dave, Dave Stevens. So I love Dave Stevens because he just tells it like it is, which is my favorite thing on earth. And Dave started off as a lonely, lowly loan officer, just like me and Kevin, and has went from that to being the advisor to the president of the United States and has done all sorts of things in between and is currently a truth sayer. Um, you can find him on LinkedIn regularly and I, I find myself off mostly. I don't know that I've ever not agreed with you. So I find that interesting. So Dave, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Good to be with you, Audrey. Yeah. Well, and the best thing about that whole thing was if you know me well, you know, I would never say nice things if I didn't believe it. So it's all true. All true. Anyway. Go. So there is so much going on as usual. So where shall we begin? Let's just talk briefly about FHA and them, you know, taking the MIP premium down a little bit, um, which should help. I mean, I ran some numbers for some clients and it actually made a difference of significant amount of money a month in their payment. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. That was a long fought effort, wasn't it? Yes. Um, look, I had a chance to speak to Julia Gordon, she's the FHA commissioner. I once had that job and I've known Julia for decades inside the Beltway. Um, when she testified to become commissioner and had to uh, go through her hearing in front of the Senate Banking Committee for the nomination, she pledged to reduce MIP premiums. Um, so it tells you how long it took to get it done. She was not the blockage, nor was Secretary Fudge. The blockage was actually the Office of Management and Budget because uh, the FHA spins off so much negative subsidy, it's called, in federal budget speak. In other words, it produces profits. It doesn't require a subsidy. And those monies were needed by the administration for other spending objectives. And so uh, she's been fighting long and hard to get this done. I'm sure they initially wanted to just, just uh, lower the uh, upfront. And I'm really glad they ended up with the annual. The annual has more bang for your buck frankly, because you can finance in <laughs> the upfront MIP. And the uh, the key with the annual is that that's a direct one-to-one, -one, you know, reduction in payment of 30 basis points. Um, and it's actually better than a 30 basis point interest drop because you're not paying interest on it. So it's just a pure cut in terms of what you pay. So it's going to have a real impact. 
It's averaging about $80 per homeowner in the United States since it's gone into effect for the, uh, the days that it's been there. Um, and so, yeah, it's meaningful and it definitely um, mitigates what Sandra Thompson has been trying to do with the LLPA grid and almost makes those moves foolish in, in, in a sense, because not only do we have this now convoluted LLPA grid and a 40 DTI and all this other stuff, it has to be changed. But on top of it, uh, the FHA, you know, single-handedly in one quick move almost wiped out any value of that in the first place. So interesting. But yeah, good move from, from FHA and couldn't be better timed. It's a spring market. And uh, so um, I'm glad she didn't wait any longer. You know what else I loved is that they didn't go, oh, and this is going to roll out in like July 1st of 2024. It's like, boom, it was done. I'm like, good job. Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. I've never seen anything in government move that fast ever. And we actually had heard the reason for the delay on the the, the decrease explained slightly differently um, from someone else. So that's an interesting, that's interesting insight for oh, us. I can, I can assure you I have the right reason, but it, uh, I don't work at HUD and I'm sure they're going to uh, dress that up a little differently in terms yes, of how they present. It, it was dressed, it, and it wasn't a terrible explanation, actually. It had to do with looking forward versus back as far as the reserves, et cetera, but you know, whatever. So it is what it is. We're there. That's good. Um, yeah. Do you see any other changes coming with FHA anytime soon or are we, are we done for the no. moment? No, right. I know that, I know that Ginny May, for those of you who understand mortgage servicing is re-looking at the PTAP facility. It's a really important facility that um, I think they've done a pretty poor job in implementing. They implemented it during the COVID pandemic, um, but it's a liquidity facility, facility that uh, independent mortgage banking servicers are most likely to tap into uh, in the event that there's a real credit contraction and they don't have access to enough credit uh, line um, authority to be able to you know, have as much cash flow to extend advances to bondholders, even with the borrowers not making the, the mortgage payment. It was so it's a, um, God, don't, I, uh, I, I forgot the acronym, but if you look up PTAP, Jimmy May, PTAP, uh -huh. you'll get an explanation, but it's basically a, a credit facility that would um, provide you essentially a line of credit if you did not have the funds to the lender so that they can make the payments to the owner of the mortgage-backed security, the Ginny May mortgage-backed security. Because as you know, with Ginny, it's a scheduled requirement and it's not based on actual payments. So you have to make those advances to the investor, whether the borrower is paying you or not. And that, that delta can cause a really uh, risky shortfall for some independent mortgage bank or services. That, that, was, that was, so, a during during yeah. was a big issue yeah. during COVID. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, it was a big issue during COVID. Right when they decided that you know, never mind, you don't need to make your payments if you don't feel yeah, like and it just, for the moment. And just, just so you understand the policy implications of it, the way, the way they did it poorly during COVID. Remember, this was during a different administration, but the way they did it, implemented it poorly during COVID, was um, they uh, you had to actually, if you wanted to uh, get access to the PTAP facility, you had to declare that you were technically insolvent, and by doing so. You were risking everything from regulatory lockdowns to warehouse lenders seeing that notification and saying, yeah. well, you can't do business with me anywhere else. And so they, I, I don't think it's structured right yet, um, but Elena McCargo, who's the Ginny May president, hopefully, um, I know she's re-looking really at it. It's actually in some of the uh, trade press today, um, but hopefully she'll uh, take a look at it and see how she can fix it because it's fixable. That's, I, you know, I don't know whether this is right or wrong, but I feel like FHA is all over it and really just addressing all sorts of concerns very carefully and um, with a lot of input from industry, from um, shareholders. I just think it's interesting and good. And so am I wrong or am, is, that's my take on no. what I'm seeing. They're actually, they're actually doing quite a bit and there's more coming out uh, that'll give um, originators uh, a better view of rep and warrant risk. Um, as you know, we're still subject to um, uh, enforcement actions that could be that that could be trouble damages using the False Claims Act. And uh, I think you're going to see 
hear before the year is over some better definition on what constitutes a defect in a loan origination file mm. worthy of having to deal with um, the False Claims Act. So, they're, they're, so but I'm they are moving. Tell you that the, the Aberdello doesn't spend a lot of time think, thinking about reps yeah. and warrants, but it is important for us to understand that that is going on in the back end and it impacts <laughs> everything. So, well, I and agree. And, and keep in mind, right now, that, uh, at the GSC side, Freddie and Fannie, particularly Freddie, are kicking back a ton of repurchases. Yes, and I don't yes, yes. You know eventually that'll trickle down to the broker if mm -hmm. you're a, fr a frequent flyer on the on the kickback list. So um, uh, in terms of your wholesale channels. So it's, it's you know, it's something you should at least be aware of, yes. especially as we go into a recession, which we are going to be going into short one. Okay, we're we'll going to come on. back. We're going to come back to recession. But I yeah. just want to say that we've been hearing about buybacks for months. I mean, a year probably, right? And it's increased, it's been a large number of buybacks from the GSEs. And so, and like you said, eventually that does touch LOs and we do need to be aware of it. So pay attention people, even if you think it's not your thing, it's your thing. Just mm -hmm. quickly, I just want to mention that FHA is also working on fixing or improving, maybe is a better way to put it, 203K too. They're looking for people's input. And so there's a lot going on there, but <laughs> let's segue into FHFA, shall we? So as we you know, we have our LOPAs and those pricing adjustments are starting to, they're, I mean, they're hitting optimal blue any moment, if not already. Um, we're, I mean, I think I heard March, early March on that, even though they're, you know, just so that they're ready when for the loans are being delivered May 1st. So we know that if your LTV is over 40, if you're, and then, I mean, we've seen the grid. We had um, one of our listeners who did an, a whole breakdown on what the difference is between what they are now and what they're going to be. And it was very interesting, especially, I mean, like investment properties got better. Go figure. I mean, on the lower LTVs, but the rest of it just seems like a mess, including that 40 PTI, which MBA is all over and NAMS on it. And um, it's, I mean, okay, so let's talk about that. Tell us what Sandra Thompson is saying about that. Just to refresh everyone's memory, she is the acting director of FHFA. And we thought that she was going to come in and be a little, different than what we're seeing. So how's that? And, and by the way, Audrey, Sandra, Sandra's no longer the acting director. She's been oh, confirmed by the Senate. She's the so director, she's the per, director. She's thank you. Director. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> look, here, here's the here's the story. Um, Sandra got has been pressuring the GSEs to come up with affordable housing plans for well over a year. What she got back from the GSEs was unacceptable to her. She, out of frustration, she finally said, I'm, giving you my own uh, um, unofficial view here. She said, screw it. I'm gonna force the GSEs to implement pricing improvements for um, you know, lower credit score, high LTV borrowers, which are probably populated with a lot of minority borrowers and first time home buyers. Uh, because the GSE's performance is terrible in that, in that context. I mean, um, FHA does five times the amount of minority lending than any other funding source in the nation. Uh, it just tells you how bad the, the GSEs are filling that void. Now, you could go through all the why you're pushing the GSEs to do this when FHA is there and all of this stuff, and I could walk you through all the public policy arguments. But so nevertheless, she came up with it. Her team came back and delivered to her a way of doing a cross-subsidy structure where the better credits will pay for the lesser credits. I was going to show you a slide. I know you've seen one. I have a different way of looking at it, but I can't share screen uh, right oh, now. On this. You know what? I know how to fix that. Please hold. <laughs> okay. Uh, so while you're doing that, um, uh, it not only, so she, she went through that work and um, as she was doing it, her team came back and they basically, she has, she has a requirement as the, as the regulator there's a fiduciary obligation as a conservator um, to, if she can't just willy nilly make changes, right? So we ended up, I'm gonna show you just two looks. You've all seen this, right? She came out with the, uh, the new grid uh, with the new fees. And so we had to then go look, what does this mean for the others? But obviously on the bottom left, we saw that new DTI um, 40 LTV or 40 DTI cap. But uh, so, we ended up looking at it in a slightly different way just to see the impact. And I'm going to show you just one of the views, not all of them, but this is 
this is the net change. I know you've seen it in another presentation, but just so we're all on the same yeah, no, page it's good. here. The, the green is improvement to particular cohorts, uh, cells of the LLPA grid, and the red is worsening of the price. Obviously, this page just covers a pure FICO LTV uh, trade-off. Remember, we have high dial loans, two to fours, cash out refis. There's a lot of impact across the board. Here's my... Here, Here's my, argue, here's my argument, guys, and I made it to in an article I wrote for Housing Wire, which I just was published a week ago, and I've spoken to uh, Sandra about it directly. Um, I know the MBA has as well, and they are meeting with her with some lenders uh, to talk it through. Um, I'm sure NAM is all, all over it. I know CHLA is all over it, but um, so she's she's been made aware the reality is that these changes where she really made the biggest improvements, which is the bottom right side of the grid, greater than 95 LTV, FICO's below 640, it's foolishness, right? Because so many lenders in the, in the agency program, Freddie, Fannie, they have FICO floors. <clears throat> they don't go down to 620 in many cases, certainly not at those, at those LTVs. So all of those improvements, no matter how much their credit modelers said, they would get some pickup in the market. They just don't realize that bank lenders and banks dominate the GSE marketplace. Non-banks dominate the Ginnie Mae market, FHA, VA, USDA. Banks have much higher FICO limitations than the non-banks do. And as a result, the likelihood of getting a real pickup here is, is not going to happen. And when you add in now the 30 basis points that um, they just dropped FHA, if you, if you try to equate, so what's 30 basis points roughly if you were to compare it to an LLPA, you know, you got to multiply that times roughly four to five, right? So that's 120 to um, 150 basis point improvement in price by dropping that mortgage insurance premium on a relative sense, if you follow my logic here. And so all of those improvements in those green sectors of the grid almost all get defeated by a 30 basis point cut in the MIP. But on top of it, she convoluted decades of risk-based pricing um, discipline that Fannie and Freddie have maintained. And something that I've always argued, you can only price to the true risk of the loan. Um, because once you start tinkering with the grid, like they're doing here, and worsening a uh, a 15% down borrower with a FICO of 740 to 760 and adding three eights, um, you're, really, you're really setting a precedent for the next regulator of the GSEs. I mean, I worried about Calabria. We all did coming in here um, and seeing what he was doing to the GSEs. And I, I felt like, I think we talked about it uh, in our last meeting together, Right. But I worry that Calabria was using the GSEs to achieve a political purpose, which he really wanted to shrink their footprint. And I fought like hell against Mark, as did a lot of others uh, in the marketplace. And thank God he's no longer head of the FHFA. He just published a book. Uh, he's doing his book signing here next week, I think. But the um, uh, if, if you if you look at. Uh, yes, well, it's, it's a reduction. Yeah, the red is the red is an, is an increase. Sorry, I'm just going back to the photos. Yeah. The yeah. red is, this is the net change in total price. Okay, that's what I was showing you. So the net change is in the red is a worsening of price over where it was before. So uh, in, in many cases, a borrower who suddenly goes through underwriting, finds out their FICO is over 40, finds out they have an add-on being charged of a quarter to three eighths, depending what the deal is, right? That's the, the add-on for the uh, right. being over 40 DTI. If they came back and said, you know, th this is bait and switch. I'm not, I don't want to pay that fee. What if I put down 10 or 15% more? If they're in those FICO bands, you're almost going to have to say, no, that's more expensive too. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy. Right? Yeah, well, I so, mean, there's a couple. Are, are you willing to share that slide with us? We can embed it in the uh, YouTube. Uh, recording when we post it is it um yeah i'll, I'll send it to you afterwards Audrey. you're so That's nice fine. i love you okay and, and and there's other ones you know we we went through an analysis with a team of capital markets people so i, I have a bunch of secondary markets folks 
and we looked at the rest of the grid too, right? This is all the worsening cells. Yeah. Um, on high bow and um, you know, high balance fixed rates, which really just kills me. Yeah. Because truthfully, the high bows, um, unfortunately, I, they perform better than low bows yeah. from a de delinquency uh -huh. standpoint. And, and if you live in a place like Washington, D.C. or California, like yeah. the conforming loan is worthless to you because it doesn't buy anything. But yeah, by the way, it's no longer just those cities, right? It's Denver, Colorado. Yeah. You know, well, the other, a bunch I mean, of other I markets. Haven't a, I haven't closed a high balance loan since last year. I put everything under jumbo if I can because the right. guidelines are better. Like the That's guidelines right. and the pricing is better if you can manage it, which I have been able to, which is great. But back to the, I mean, okay, how many loans start and finish with the same income and DTI, right? So you price the loan, you quote a rate, blah, 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 yeah. you disclose to the borrower, you're under 40, and then boom, the underwriter comes in and says, no, do, no, that's not going to work, well, or and, whatever. And, and so and, then, can you imagine those conversations and the compliance right. and is the CP, I mean, what is, is the CPMP going to do about all those change the circumstance? I mean, it is a yes. disaster in my opinion. It does, Kevin. So, so do, do do this if you can when we're done. Just Google my article on housing wire. It's, you don't have to be, I think it's outside the firewall. You don't have to be a uh, subscriber. Because I lay out all the arguments. Sanders read it. She called me right after I published it. And, um, you know, there's other arguments we made here. First of all, look, I, I get the objective. Let's improve the GSE's ability to provide competitive financing for borrowers, for, for FICO LTV, um, uh, elements that often have a higher concentration of minority borrowers. Right. I, I, I totally applaud that FHA shouldn't be the sole source for African-American and Hispanics with low down payments to be able to get a home. But the thing I also know is those 620 FICO buckets over 95 LTV, they're not going to get a bank doing that well. I mean, they're just not going to do that deal. And, uh, and so in the end of the day, all that stuff that looks pretty on paper and looks probably good to a lot of civil rights advocates and uh, liberal public housing interests in Washington, they just don't understand the business. They just don't understand that's not going to work. Um, and so as a result, that's a problem. But the, the, the greater fault here is all the ways that she's violating the discipline behind risk-based pricing, which is what built the GSEs, the precedent it sets. And that 40 DTI, are you kidding me? I know. Um, not only is it going to be a customer service nightmare because you're going to say, okay, you know, you're good. Here's your rate uh, based on the pre-app information. Uh, even when you take the app at point of sale and then your underwriter comes back and says, that's 40.1. Yep. Yes. Yeah. I, I got to charge a fee. Right. Then you got to go back to the bar and say, you got to pay more. The bar is going to say, you just bait and switched me. Yes. Yeah, I'm pissed off. I'm going to tell you, my realtor, to never work with you again because you're yes. untrustworthy. I want to call the CFPB and complain. I mean, they've set up just a, a, a storm of problems here. And 40s below even the 43 I DTI know. that was in the original QM rule. Exactly. So it's crazy. And she it didn't is. do this. She didn't do this because they're high risk. She did this because her risk modelers had to come up with enough offsetting revenue streams for the cuts she made in those particular cells mm -hmm. and the increases she made in those other cells didn't quite get her there. So by putting the DTI cap in with an extra fee, their modeling said, okay, we're gonna get X number of loans that will now have this quarter or three eighths on it. And that gets us over the hump of not having this be a net but the reality uh, cost of capital. Loan. Now, the reality is me as a loan officer, I'm gonna see that and I go, wait a minute, let's just do a jumbo loan instead. And now yeah. they've lost that revenue. Yeah, well, I mean, I, okay, so although, you, you, although, although Kevin, as you know, you can't do a jumbo loan at ninety-five either. Um, True. And so, or ninety, and so well, that's you know, right those, now, but we were doing them before all this hit. What back in two thousand seven? Uh, two two thousand even. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, are you really going back 23 freaking years, Kevin? All, 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 I was, all I would say is that you, we did those back in the day when there was a healthy private label securitization market, and there right. is none. Right. Right. There is none. So every buyer, right. every every jumbo loan buyer is basically putting it on a balance sheet, a bank balance sheet, or you have a few guys like Penny Mac and Redwood who are doing some securitizations and, and trying to get execution on there. And I'm guessing... 
you know, when you guys are selling your jumbos, you're selling to one of the either the big banks on a whole lot basis or whatever. Yeah, Chase, City, okay. uh, et cetera. Let's bottom line this. Is she going to back off? And by the way, I have this little theory to see if it has any bear, any any weight to it at all. So I'm like, did she throw? So you're saying that the DTI was part of the modeling, which I guess will throw my theory right out the window, which was, I'm like, maybe it was wag the dog where, okay, we want all these LOPAs to stick, but we'll throw the DTI in and that'll be the thing we'll give up in the end. So, and then we'll keep the LOPAs. All right. So, so please, yeah. are we getting rid of any of this? Is it sticking? Is there any I love your logic can we do? Tell me, Dave. Well, we well the, MB, the MBA is going back and arguing just for the DTI. Right. And I, I think they'll get the DTI. But um, uh, the whole construct is, is terrible. And so I'm going to write something more aggressive in a, in a, trade, mag, a trade publication here over the next week um, to, because I think Sandra's really missing this. But um, you know, I did a first round. I was very polite to Sandra and I, uh, recognizing her objectives here, but they've they've really screwed this up, and it isn't going to be effective pull, pulling more minority borrowers into those cells that got improved for all the reasons we've said. Uh, okay, but no, then, she didn't. She didn't do the forty percent with some, you know, manipulative concept in her mind. That that's that's what I'll give up. Okay, I'll let it this go. Is, this is what happens. Sandra's a lifelong lifetime bureaucrat in Washington. She's never had a real job. She's always she's worked at a whole variety of different public uh, uh, federal regulators her entire career. Um, I met her when she was when she came into FHFA many years ago, um, and now now she's ultimately the director. But she doesn't know mortgage. You know, you guys are the type that you can look at a grid and instinctually know, like, mm -hmm. we're not going to get any mortgages there. And you're just screwing, you're screwing a really better credit quality borrower, and making right. them pay more. None of this makes any sense. But she, she has no instincts. She doesn't really understand the business. And then her advisors at FHFA certainly don't either. Mm -hmm. I, can I can assure you, one of the jobs I held was, I ran a single family business at Freddie Mac. I was a senior vice president of Freddie for all, three quarters of a decade, ran all single family business. And I can tell you from our seats, had our regular tried to force us to do this back in the day, we would have been fighting it tooth and nail. And I can assure you that the current leadership under DeVito at Freddie and primarily Benson's pretty much running Fannie today. I, I'm certain that their team was kicking back on FHFA on this, but they are restricted on making public comment. So um, it is what it is. I think FHFA forced them to do this. Uh, I think the other, just last thing I'll just say in this, Audrey and Kevin is, um, Sandra's greatest mistake here, she didn't consult industry. She did this without calling in a lender advisory board, which used to exist under Mel Watt, and getting input from people who are in capital markets, and can help explain to her the implications of what she's about to do. The MBA was surprised when the announcement came out. I, I'm, I know Nam was surprised. I know uh, all the other trades were. And that's a that's a terrible relationship to have with such an important regulator. You should never be surprised. The regulator should always pre-inform mm -hmm. the head of the MBA and, the, and some of the other key trades of what's going to be coming out and give them a chance to potentially slow down that announcement if it's going to be damaging. Didn't happen that way. We got right. the announcement, it hit the market, and we all went into reaction mode. So at least this not, time, not good behavior. Now, at least this time they announced it well enough in advance so that they could price it into the pricing. Mm -hmm. Like during COVID, remember when they- Oh yeah, that's right. The LPAs and all of a sudden like, wait a minute, we've already- Oh my God, that was yeah. an absolute- That was worse. Yes. That was, I mean- COVID I, was worse. Again, again, this idea that- uh, uh, and I guess I probably shouldn't bring up their current um, uh, gains. I mean, they, they posted their profits. And we're talking about in a bloodbath of a year where everyone and their mother is losing their job and companies are going down. And there they are posting billions of dollars in gains every quarter. And it just blows me away when they pull this stunt. It just... Uh, Okay. Yeah, keep in mind, well, keep in mind the profits of Freddie and Fannie had nothing to do with Sandra, but Sandra had everything to do with this policy change. <laughs> okay, I get it, sort of, but I also think that it should be part of the conversation. I mean, okay, if you're if you're like looking at uh, well, anyway, it ultimately. 
these loans are are very profitable, right? That's the bottom yeah, line. And guy, guy, guy Schwartz is asking a question. Are the LLPAs based on actual losses? The LLPA adjustments are based on modeled expected default rates. And so actual losses is difficult because you forecast through econometric modeling expected default. And then you, you have an expected severity, which is <clears throat> your loss um, based on your models. So is it based on actual losses? No, because you know the last two years, we've had about 35% of pre home price appreciation. But on model performance on a book over time, which econometric modeling looks at other um, recession and economic scenarios as they build into that economic, econ econometric model, it's considered statistically accurate to go at it that way. So was it based on actual losses? No, but was it based on real expected losses on, on the book or profits thereof? Yes. And so okay. she did a cross, she did a cross subsidy. She said, I'm going to take from the better credits and subsidize the worst credits. Um, and that's kind of how that played out. So after 121 months of prices going up, we are having a slight moderation in pricing. Delinquencies are still at pre-pandemic, below pre-pandemic level, levels, even though if you read the headlines, you wouldn't necessarily know that. CoreLogic <laughs> just came out with their loan performance data today. 30 days have gone from 2.9% or 2.9 to 3%. 90 day plus is stayed stable at 1.2%. Foreclosures are three per three tenths of the market. They're multi-decade lows. Uh, hello, like what modeling? Why are they modeling this way? Why? Based on all the information we're seeing, everything we're uh, well. Look, look. Explain, Dave look let, 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 let's put our real <coughs> our our, uh, our reality hat on, which is okay. You're you're not going to price loans to current performance because we're coming off of two right. of the biggest a period of incredible boom. Right. Um, a pre home price appreciation. We built up massive home, home ownership equity with historically low interest rates and, and the lowest unemployment rates in decades. Um, right. And so you're not going to build any model for that. When you build a model, um, you build it against a whole variety of recessions that are all built into your, your econometric model. And that will include the Great Recession at its worst. It'll go all the way back to the oil patch crisis of the 80s. Uh, the dot-com bust in 2000, the 2004 spring um, uh, correction. And so all of that goes into play. And you, you, you need to do that. If you're, if you're going to set pricing on mortgages, you're not pricing it for today. You're pricing it for what could happen down the road. And look, we're going to go into recession here. Um, it's, it will be shallow. I promise you. It's going to be short-lived and very shallow. But we're going to see that we're in it here uh, in the near term. And... You know, that's got some people worrying. But to your point, Audrey, reading the numbers that CoreLogic put out, it's going to take a real shock to threaten um, the overall credit risk profile of Fannie or Freddie's or the Ginnie Mae book. Right. Um, on the Ginnie Mae books, they've taken such large mortgage insurance premiums, even after the 30 basis point cut. And the mortgage, mutual mortgage insurance fund is so huge. It's never been as big uh, as this in its history. It can withstand 15% default rates, not, uh, you know, not one and a half or 2% or whatever we may see. And for the GSEs, the credit quality of, the, of, the, of their books and the average LTV of their books is very low. And don't forget, the MMI covering them for first loss protection right. down into the mid sixty LTVs for for almost all the ones that have MMI. Like we've seen massive appreciation over the last couple of years. So yeah, and so they, we do it. And so the existing portfolio, in terms from a risk standpoint, has a ton of equity sitting on it. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's to think that there's really any risk here in the in the in the business is uh, ridiculous. But I do understand that they need to price reflecting what could happen on a 30-year mortgage over a 30-year period, or let's say expected life of a loan, which may be five to seven years. Um, but, uh, you know, somehow, um, yeah, the 10-year spread. We have a lot of stuff we could cover here for a guy. He's asking some good questions. I know, I know. Just pick, <laughs> pick and choose because, yeah, pick and choose. <laughs> anyway, 
Yeah, so don't don't expect them to change a model and make stupid decisions. They're going to do that, and um, okay. and they should. Can and we they agree need to be. This was a stupid decision. This one is a stupid decision. It has okay. nothing to do with with uh, risk management. So. Okay, so can we just briefly? Can I ask a question that I've always wrestled with since you yeah. were head of FHA or F Freddie Mac, and um, and you believe in this risk based pricing idea? I've always thought it was a little. How shall we put it? Shaky, and my. My reasoning was, show me the algorithms that, that show that there should be a 3 8 hit on cash out at 20% LTV because it's riskier. Please. I don't believe it for one freaking second. I never did. I've gotten into arguments, flight arguments, sort of, um, but arguments nonetheless over this with um, the different reps who insist that the algorithms have shown that there are losses anyway, blah, blah, blah. Is it a bunch of bupkis or is they is it really riskier when you've got an LTV at well, 20% look, literally? Let, let, me, let, let me give you the reality of, of uh, okay. the GS the GSCs, GSCs are gonna tell their um, sales team to tell the, the yes. company line. Okay. Yes. Yes. But the uh, uh, on, on general terms, any risk manager of any major financial institution, including Fannie and Freddie, will tell you if you do a rate and term refi, you're actually improving the expected yes. performance of the loan because um, you, you're all obligated to co comply with benefit to borrower on a, on a refi uh, rate and term. And so that means they're getting their payment reduced. And so you right. your, your, you already owned the risk of that mortgage. The risk is going to remain the same, except that the net debt to income ratio goes down to whatever that difference is in the payment reduction that they achieved mm -hmm. by doing the refinance. And so anybody who says we're going to add a fee to refis because they're higher risk is just full of crap. Now, on a cash out refi, there are other variables in play. We right. saw during leading up to the Great Recession, not all of you were around prior to the Great Recession. Kevin, you obviously were because you've been quoting jumbos back going long before that. <laughs> but um, as someone who began as a loan rep in 1983, I've lived through a lot of this stuff. But I will tell you, you know, we were very concerned about equity stripping. Um, mm -hmm, right. leading, up to, leading up to the 2008 recession. And equity stripping is nothing more than cash out refis. And unfortunately, it was a game, right? Because we were artificially inflating home values with a lot of bad credit quality lending. Yes. No doc, 100 LTV, Negan, all combined together to fog the mirror and get a mortgage. And so anybody could get a loan for the most part. Um, and so we had, we created a bubble. And along the way, however, borrowers would, you know, get a uh, uh, an option arm, pay option arm on the monthly uh, with a teaser rate at the end of the year. Property had gone up ten percent. They cash out, refi, and get a new teaser rate on top of it. Don't think this is. I'm not exaggerating. This was happening in a pretty no, large. No, we know. Step. We were. Yeah, we were and, there. And with so, five. and so, it. so there is a concern. So, is a cash out refi the same as a rate and term? No, there uh -huh. is. There is relatively additional risk, but if you cap the LTV at eighty, let's just start there, and you do, and you and you have to prove ability to repay, which is required yes. now yes. under Dodd Frank, you have an entirely different risk scenario than you yes. ever have ever had before yeah. in the cash yeah. market. Yeah. And so, um, you know, is a fee reasonable? Maybe at certain LTVs or at certain FICO scores, yes. but generally speaking, um, I don't think you're necessarily worsening the risk of that borrower. And, uh, and in many cases, the cash you're giving them is going to pay off other debts. And so it's just an interesting debate. But they do clearly have risk modelers to look at cash out refis along all of those types of issues along the spectrum. And they attach costs to each of those kind but of attributes. Dave, Dave, my Christmas present this year, I would like it to be a look at those algorithms and the risk and the look at the actual number to see what that looks like. And by the way, we have had this discussion. I'm going to put you in timeout if you say great recession one more time. You understand me? We've discussed this before. It was not great. It was a freaking nightmare. So if we could come up with some, you know, the great mess, the great disaster, the great holy crap, whatever. Well, the, it's fine. the other thing, not the great and, recession. And, 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 you know, in academia, they call it either the Great Recession or the Housing Recession. And I prefer to call it the Great Recession over the Housing Recession. I don't know. 
so I mean, we have got, to admit we caused that recession i mean i'll own you know as an no, industry, no, I did. it was me personally it probably I mean, yeah, yes. yeah probably yeah. So, guy and uh, answer and answer to your questions is yes no yes 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 no no i'm just kidding <laughs> Well, you do have a yeah. lot of good questions here. Does second yeah. homes merit the same adjustment as non-owner? Um, no, they don't. That was purely done out of policy reasons. I know I for a fact. Second homes. Yeah. That's why. They, they don't believe that there, there's a there's a there's an ongoing belief, particularly in the Republican Party, uh, but also with conservative Democrats, that the GSEs the GSEs uh, as government backed entities are there to support primary owner-occupied residences and to expand home ownership. They believe that second homes, uh, cash outs, two to fours, all of these things can be supported, should be supported by the primary market. Now you'll argue that, but there is no primary market for this stuff. They're, they're, you can't, it's hard to get financing for this. And many economists will argue that's because you've created what's called a pro-cyclical economic environment and all pro-cyclical means is that you set policies in place that actually block out the ability for the private sector uh, to engage because you've given the GSE such a wide footprint. Mm -hmm. It's, mm -hmm. it's pro-cyclicality is killing the ability for the private sector um, to engage in that marketplace. And so in the end of the day, People will make the argument, look, if we shrink the GSEs, which is what Calabria wanted to do, charge more for second homes, charge more the two, two to fours, he was going to eliminate cash out refis. Make no mistake about it. He was on his way there. Um, lower loan limits, or at least charge huge fees for high bow, which is where he's heading down that path, um, so that you, you, you really restrict what the GSEs do to primary residents, first time home buyers within a reasonable uh, lending range. Um, then the rest of the market, Wall Street, as it were, will see opportunity and they'll come in and make markets there. Now, will that happen? If you ask Redwood, they would say, yeah, that'll happen. We can, if, if the GSEs would only shrink, we can be more successful re-engaging re in, a, in a PLS market. Pinto hey. would say, hell no, it'll never happen. They and so it's a big debate. During COVID, what went away immediately? Jumbo non-QM, boom, gone. Like there was right. no liquidity for it. That market just disappeared for a bit. Like, right. so, I mean, it really made the case for, we need a strong FHFA GSEs. I mean, we need them. Like they're important to the market. They're important to our borrowers. And so, you know, for that to not be acknowledged, I think is a mistake. Well, I, well you know, what, one of the things, if you guys, whoever's going to go, um, when you have a lobby day, whether it's a NAM lobby day or MBA's, National Advocacy Conference or CH, everybody has their, their lobby days. To your point, Kevin, they do listen. I, I love hearing yes. you say that because I ran one of the biggest lobby organizations. I guess it was the biggest lobby organization in our industry. Um, and I always, people would always say, what do I say? Are they gonna, you know, I don't wanna have to make those calls. I would tell you, they always listen. And this is a time to go in and, and get a good articulation of what your concern is. And you can't, you can't boil the ocean, right? So if you're going to go meet with a legislator, you can't go in with 15 things. Right. They don't you even, they barely, they barely understand mortgage. Yeah, so you've got to go in with, what are my priorities? And I would say yes. three is the max. You know, what is it that I want that, that member of Congress or the state house, whatever it may be, to walk away thinking? And, um, and that's how you begin to have influence, I think. Yeah, 100%. Okay, there's a couple other things I want to get through before we are run out of time, which always seems to go really fast with you. I don't know why. Um, a couple of things. So CFPB um, is going, their uh, very existence is going, well, as it stands, is going before the Supreme Court. Let's talk about that for a moment, because it's a big deal. I mean, and and I'm just going to say that if 10 years ago, you had told me that I would think that we need the CFPB, I would have thought you were insane. But now I do believe we need the CFPB or some version of that organization. And so you know, what are your thoughts on this? Is it- what yeah, Everybody yell at Audrey, don't yell at me. No, what? <laughs> yeah. Oh, what I am I yelled at what, 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 what are my <laughs> thoughts on this? I, I would tell you if you spoke to any major lender who you sell your loans to today, the last thing they want to do is go back and create chaos and disruption right. by wiping out the bureau. We've yeah. got a lot of rules in place. Those rules have been operationalized into our world. And 
you pull the rug out from under that um, and send it back to each of the investors to redesign their own rules to the, the regulators who will fill in the gaps. It could get worse. I mean, states, some states, California, yeah. um, they may double down and say, screw that. We're taking over where the CFPB didn't go and, and make even They're doing that. tougher rules. And so, yeah, the wild, it's hard enough, I understand, fighting uh, individual states and particularly some states. But I would say also we don't want the Wild West back. What the Supreme Court case is challenging is the funding mechanism. As you know, right. the, the CFP is not, CFPB is not subject to budgeting. Uh, they don't have to go through appropriations like HUD does. HUD's on the federal budget. Every penny they spend has to go through an official budgeting process, uh, gets approved by appropriators. Uh, ultimately, it needs a majority vote by both parties with the president signing, it, uh, signing that budget into law. Um, and, you know, granted, we haven't passed many budgets. We've been operating under continuing resolutions. But nevertheless, that's a theory of how government runs. The Bureau has no budget constraints. There is no budget authority over them from Congress. And I think at its forefront, you're beginning to see where the concerns are. Now, FHFA is similar to that, but FHFA gets funded by the GSEs. Uh, so they pay for their regulator. The Bureau gets funded by the taxpayer. And that's why half of CFPB is an enforcement agency that tries to exact, you know, uh, penalties in any way, shape or form from mortgage lenders across the country. I'm not to, trying to be overly negative on the Bureau. I yeah. do think their enforcement um, side of their business is completely money? out of control. What's that? Did you, say, did you say exact money from them or extract money from them? Ex well, they, they extract money from them. It doesn't actually go back to them directly. It goes to Congress. It goes to the federal budget. But when they need money, they have permanent and indefinite authority to draw money from Treasury whenever they want to spend money. If they want to build a new facility, which they did in D.C. I don't know if you know that. They used yeah. to have yes, their, offices, their offices originally were those dirty old offices across from the White House. Yep. And now they're across from HUD in that beautiful building. But, you know, it's it's. Uh, it's a phenomenon, it's a challenging policy one. I think the Supreme Court, as we all know, which is now a complete wild card on um, yeah. all of this stuff, um, it will be interesting to see where they land on this. I could easily see them ruling that the funding mechanism uh, isn't constitutionally legal. And, uh, and then we'll have to see what happens. They already ruled against, um, the role of the director, as you know, um, yes. and they, the previously the director could only be terminated for cause. Now the director can be terminated at will of the president. And that's how Calabria ended up out of a job. Um, I mean, not Calabria, but uh, what's her name? Who ran the bureau last time? Excuse mm -hmm. me. Blank. Um, the other guy. Oh my God. Kathy. Woman. Um, yeah, Kathy uh, something. Yeah. Okay. So, well, she was memorable. You memorable. <laughs> right. So anyway, I just just watch out. It's going to be a long run here for the Supreme Court to come back Craniger. with anything on Craniger, this. Right? Kathy Craniger. It'll be a couple of years probably before we hear much on this, maybe a year oh. and a half, but oh. um, could be later this year, possibly. Yeah, but someone was saying June. You time. don't think so? Um, I think that Not June? Quick. I don't know. I think it would be quick. Okay. All right. Um, uh, as along the CFPB uh, news, they shut down Majestic Home Loans, who had actually been slapped on the hand over and over and over again since 2015 for misleading VA borrowers, really charming folks who do that. So, I mean, they, they are doing some good things. So anyway, I'm just, ugh, good Lord. Okay, another thing I just wanted to touch on because um, it is, as they are, are they're ending the COVID um, era measures or protections guidelines right now. And one of them was allowing people to work remotely from home. Um, or wherever they were going to work remotely. And now this is being looked at as, you know, because before you had to work out of a licensed location, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is coming up at the state level for a lot of people that states are looking at this. And my concern is people aren't aware of it. And then it's just going to come out of nowhere and boom, you're not going to, I mean, literally, you're not going to be able to work from home in some states, potentially. I, I'm hoping that um, MBA is definitely taking a stand on this and addressing it. And yeah. if there are things like calls to action, I think it's important that we all respond so that um, people understand 
how important it is to continue that flexibility potentially, or I guess we decide that it isn't, and then and then what, right? So well, thoughts, I, I Dave see Stevens? This as, as an option towards, it's gonna push a lot of small brokerage shops to become mortgage bankers. Uh, because they won't be able to meet with the compliance rules that'd be that tight uh, as from what I've seen of these rules like they're it's like they won't be able to to come up with all the costs of the, the well you know the one the one thing that aligns but yeah I believe I, I agree with the cost piece the one thing that aligns obviously brokers and independent mortgage bankers is how you guys have to deal with safe um, mm -hmm. from a licensing perspective. I think the remote workforce is, it's gonna be a challenge. I know the MBA is on it. They are working with NMLS on this to try to get alignment. Um, and uh, so, I, I mean, I agree it's a problem because of COVID and the expansion that exists, that, create, that our industry created during that period of time, we are hiring people all around the country working from home right. um, <laughs> to underwrite process closers, Etc. And um, I don't know how you you um, go backwards here. It's just right. we have to see how the process works. I'm hoping that um, there'll be actually a, a, a legitimate, reasonable way to continue our remote employment under certain constraints. And we'll have to see what those are. I, mean, I hope so too. Although I did, I saw a headline from the Wall Street Journal, and only Kevin has access to that, but it said. Everyone else is back to the office. Why aren't we in the U.S.? And I don't know the answer because I couldn't read the article. So maybe Kevin could check it out for us and well, uh, report back. That'd be great. Well, I, I, read the, uh, I read the DFBI's guidelines. So DFBI is the regulator for California um, for the mortgage banks. And yep. um, so it's interesting because they don't oversee mortgage brokers. They only oversee mortgage bankers. And any mortgage banker that's not doing their guidelines. I mean, I was going down the list. I'm like, well, we do that. We do that. We do that. We do that. Um, but if I went to a small brokerage shop, they they don't have all of their loan officers using this one email server that the company can monitor. They don't um, have secure servers where clients can upload documents to them securely. They, well, I don't think you should generalize for all mortgage brokers. I think that true. they're the smaller, smaller shops, shops, perhaps. The smaller shops. Um, yeah. You know. Well, Kevin, Kevin, let me let me just suggest this, and this is unfortunately the way all regulators have behaved. Is this is when are you so small that you can fly under the radar? And yeah. uh, look, it doesn't mean you're you're out of, you're at risk, and it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be aware that you're violating regulations, whether state or federal, but the ability for state agencies or federal agencies to enforce, do enforcement actions on small, it's smaller really lenders, whether non-bank or broker doesn't really matter. It gets really difficult. Um, however, you know, your wholesale lender who you're selling your loans to as a broker, they're obligated to make sure that their vendors are compliant and you're considered a vendor to the lender that you do business with right. as a mortgage broker. And so, um, you know, the, the, the stopping of the foot may come from somewhere. We just don't know where, you know, my own sense of doing business is, I mean, I run an independent consulting business, um, which is busier than I ever thought it would be. And I literally was on working with my server company all this morning, adding new layers of security to my email. Um, yeah. You know, you need you need just to have a responsibility about how you run your business. And we all know when it comes to uploading things like confidential documents, there's a lot of third party vendors that even the smallest broker in the world can uh, use their software um, and contract with them. And that creates the ability to behave in a similar way. But all I would just again say is we're seeing this across the board. We're seeing this with comp packages that are being provided at the loan officer level that to me look clearly outside what's uh, what's allowed under the rule. We're seeing marketing agreements. We're seeing offerings of kickbacks to real estate agents directly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you and I, I don't held you up, Kevin. And I start, you know, but when I started, yeah, you, you couldn't do business in Long Island without paying off the real estate agent. I mean, but it, it is, it, I think these are the exceptions and not the rule. And 
I think the reality is we got to understand what the regulators' requirements are and run our companies according to them because at some point it'll come back to get you. I, I find it very interesting when I'm talking to lenders across the country to hear what brokers say to them about what they you know need to do or should do or can't do. Like for instance, there was um, an an account executive that I was talking to yesterday who said that there was a broker who was like she told them that they had to send in a broker package before they could send in their file or you know to send in a file and he said uh, uh, most you know we're a big name like people don't require that of us and i'm thinking at what point did people stop asking for financials for any you know agreements for i don't get it like i i hear these crazy stories of LOs doing things or not doing things of borrowers demanding certain things and the LOs not pushing back and, you know, saying absolutely not like we are. Oh, and the, and the pressure, the pressure of the business makes it harder. Right. I mean, when we were shooting ducks in a barrel in 2020 and 2021, compliance was at its all time highest um, <laughs> because we were we were shooing away anybody who was on the margin. We just didn't we didn't have right. time for that business. Most of us. Right. Most of the industry now, now, are now people are desperate and they're putting pressure on their companies. Uh, mm -hmm. They're putting pressure on their management to let them do things. They're pointing to the other lender and saying, look at what so-and-so is doing. Right, Why can't right. we do the same thing? And I get these calls from CEOs all the time saying, Dave, you know, have you seen this? What's your view of it? I just had one. I'm not going to, I can't name lenders, but they're no, both good sized both good size lenders. The one inquiring and the one doing what I thought was a violate clear violation of uh, section eight. And, and, and so it's just interesting what happens when markets get difficult in our industry is a little bit of herding cats and getting consistency in application across the entire system is a virtual impossibility. It's also what makes our system really great by the way, but it's really difficult to get um, you know, an evenly common consistent application of how everybody does business across the marketplace. Right. And unless they all have compliance attorneys that all feel look, look at the business the same way, you're going to see that variability continue. And the only way we'll find out if it was not right is if there's an enforcement action. So we were, you know, when, we, you, when, you, when you want the Bureau to shut down enforcement, be careful what you ask for. You know, I just no. think in the end of the day, you, you, gotta, you, get, you get two sides of every, of every sort. So I remember when we were trying to sort out LO Comp and we assembled a panel of compliance managers and attorneys before it was implemented, trying to figure out what the rules really were. And yeah. everyone had a different answer. And then it goes into effect. And then we find out when people got million, multi-million dollar spankings from the CFPB, what the real answers were. And even then there's disagreement. And even all, 13 years later, there's still disagreement. It's just amazing. All right, so we are, I cannot believe how fast this time goes. Um, I just wanna briefly tell people what to look forward to in the upcoming weeks. Uh, next week, we're going to have Robbie Chrisman um, with us. And the week after that, we'll have Lawrence Yoon, who is chief economist for NAR. You know um, so, pardon me? I said, Dave, you know that guy? Lawrence is a good guy. Yes, he's he a is. good guy. And so, yeah. And Rob's a good guy, too, although he's way too serious. Oh, no, this is Robbie. <laughs> this is Robbie, his son. Oh, Robbie. Okay. No, yeah. Robbie. And, and actually, well, we, you know, Rob's, Rob's wife worked in the correspondent channel at Wells Fargo for years. And as many of you know, I ran wholesale at Wells. So just, I love, I've always bumped into Rob at various events along the way. But He's a yeah, great Robbie. guy. And Sean is great. Like his wife's great. Like they're great people. Wonderful, wonderful. So this is yeah. his son who we tried to have on and he was halfway there and halfway not. His dad popped on with him. It was when his like he had been under what seven or eight days of no water, no, no electricity. Um, when the flooding started, like when yeah. was that? Into December, beginning of January. So anyway, so he'll be with it. And the kid, he's a, he's young, but he's been in the business since he was a teenager. He's actually when you give him a real direct question, he's got a, an answer. He understands the business, and he brings the average age of the people on the screen down considerably, which is a good thing <laughs> now and then. So Dave Stevens, I just want to say thank you again so much. Um, you are really wonderful and we appreciate you. Please, everyone, we would like it if you would share um, our, our links with your friends and have them watch too. We have YouTube where you can go back and watch the recordings. We'll get the charts from Dave and embed those within the 
YouTube uh, recording. So with that, we'll look forward to seeing you again sometime soon, Dave. And to everyone else, have a great week. It's We're going to get through all this. It's always something. It'll be fine. And just focus on building your business and remembering what it is to be a salesperson, for God's sake. All right. With that, bye, guys. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Yeah.